So it's worth it's worth noting that Verso keeps getting interesting things written on these cards. I don't know if she's telling people to write the interesting things that she knows I'm going to be interested in, but then when she sees there's something interesting on the card, she won't let me have it <laughs> because she wants me to be surprised. Oh, I see. And then I just stare at it and go, am I reading that right? All right, I am not going to attempt to pronounce your last name. It's Volake. Volake. Yeah, yeah, I always say Volake. Yeah. And no. Okay. J.P. Volake. Yeah. And where can we find you on Twitter and on the internet? Uh, I am at LaDuck on Twitter, and then uh, unfortunately it's volleke.com, which means you need to know how to spell it. V-O-I-L-L-E-Q-U-E. There you go, yeah. And, uh, but you can also get to, to it from the Twitter profile page. That's my yeah. dirty little secret. That's how I get to everyone's websites yeah, all the time. Exactly. I just go, because I, I can remember everyone's Twitter. It's like your own special bookmarks. It's I was trying. I was recently trying to explain Twitter to a group of people who knew nothing about it at mm-hmm. the City Club Salon, mm-hmm. and someone was saying, "Well, why don't you just text message, you know, for example, Betsy?" Mm-hmm. And and I say because I don't have Betsy's phone number, <laughs> but I do know what her Twitter handle is, and so I can, you know, That's use a proxy. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's much better. I love Twitter. Twitter's great. Okay, so do you want to start with the fact that you're a speaker, or do you want to start with the extreme arts and sciences? Um, I'm happy to start uh, with the fact that I'm a speaker. Okay, why don't you tell us, you just had your talk not too yeah. long ago, yeah, right yeah, before yeah. lunch. Uh, yeah, uh, Paula, who who unfortunately couldn't make it to this session, but is coming to talk to you tomorrow. Fantastic. Um, and I did a talk about open source and its interactions with the law, mm-hmm. and how to be, you know, an open source developer in a proprietary software world, uh, and also how to be an open source developer that maybe releases things without perhaps thinking about all the ramifications. Um, so there's the very risk averse lawyer piece, and then there's the let's get it done and have fun piece. And so we tried to, I mean, we we did some basic kind of groundwork laying, and then we just took questions, and all the questions were very good and. You know. I wandered through part of the questions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the uh, comments, being a commenter and copyright. Yeah. And yeah. So what was the uh, what was the outcome? What was the general consensus? Well, the general consensus is that there you you should find a lawyer who gets it if you can, and mm-hmm. and then be sure to ask some preliminary questions of them when you're thinking about what your terms of service should look like or uh, what license to pick or even how to distribute a given a given thing. Do you control the distribution chain of a piece of open source software or do you just, you know, as the GPL would have you do, set it free and, and hope for the best? And so because controlling a piece of open source software kind of defeats the purpose. Right, it's sort of, of funny. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But there are liabilities that happen. Um, my standing joke is that everyone at this conference is an online service provider, whether they know it or not. So they they fall under regulatory frameworks that they maybe don't think about, but then all of a sudden there's a takedown letter through the DMCA or something like that, and you're kind of like, oh dear, what do I do now? You know, Oops. and uh, yeah, and so so having some procedures in place and kind of knowing where you're coming from is a good is a good thing to do. So be proactive about it. Don't wait until you get that takedown right, notice. Right, absolutely. Before that. Have a, well, or just at least have a plan. Yeah. You know, know that there's somebody in the organization who, you know, can, can pull the trigger on responding to those kinds of issues. And then, you know, ideally, you're never going to end up in court anyway, but if you do end up in court, you know, you'll have that kind of cover your ass piece yeah. taken care of, so... But That's it was a great. really important piece. Yeah, it really is. And Paula's been, you know, in the trenches. I mean, I'm kind of still relatively fresh out of law school, and so mm-hmm. kind of a newbie. I can rant and rave and talk critically about things, but uh, but Paula's been in the trenches for you know two decades now, and um, is a great attorney. Knows a ton about intellectual property and trademark stuff, as specifically as it applies to software, software development. And so it was. We were really lucky to pull her in. Uh, for the talk, so I think I think people benefited. So, does uh, open source present a, a different set of difficulties than proprietary software? It does and it doesn't. It, proprietary software gets to utilize all of the traditional, like legal attack dog strategies mm-hmm. that are in the quiver of any given lawyer, yeah. um, because you. 
you want it to be locked down. You want nobody to touch it. You want no one to, you know, trade on your mark or to uh, steal any of your stuff. And, and, you know, I mean, so that's just in the wheelhouse of every traditional lawyer on the planet is the, that kind of like, rawr, build a moat. Yeah, you know, bring in the dragons and set them strategically around the piece of product. And so the, I think the biggest challenge to some extent is getting lawyers to unclench a little and think about what it might mean to have an open source product or what it might mean to try and drive a project collectively and collaboratively and how you still protect the participants because there's still stuff that can happen that's bad. So you do want that level of, of interest in, you know, again, the, just a standard cover your ass type strategies, but also more specifically, like how do we protect what's special about open source? Um, and there is some movement in that direction. There have been some lawsuits under the new public license and the, and the new libraries, the various GPL libraries um, available for developers where people aren't adhering to the standards set up by the license, which is share and share alike, you know, attribute what you're doing to where it came from, you know, push back to the community anything you do to improve it. All those kinds of things are just as important to protect as the traditional, like, you know, Microsoft Office user license stuff, so. When I saw that you were doing a talk, I, I did some thinking. <laughs> and and I, I, I just found kind of an interesting correlation, at least between contract law and open source, because basically contracts are, are boilerplates, right? Mm -hmm. They're all the same. You go, you take them, and no matter what you're doing, there's a standard procedure for it, and you can take that and make it your own, and that seemed like a very open source kind of thing for me, because no one's going to sue you for using a contract right. and making it your own. Right. So I thought that was a nice... I actually thought that that... Yeah, I mean, we're horrible. A circle for me. Well, no, I mean, the, the, the joke is always that, you know, and particularly in fiction and poetry, we're all just terrible thieves. You know, I mean, we just we steal the best stuff and we put it into our own amalgam mm -hmm. of language, and that's absolutely true of attorneys. Attorneys don't like to invent things; they like to take stuff that somebody's already written and you know tweak it sufficiently to make it fit the current situation. Um, so, in that sense, there is a code base, if mm -hmm. we can call it that, of of things that have worked in the past. There's an open question as to whether how adaptive that code base can be in these kinds of circumstances. And what makes lawyers the most nervous is uncertainty. We don't really care if it's a bad outcome, if we can see it coming down the pike. It's like, all right, we know we're going to have to deal with this if you insist on going in this direction. Um, but if you insist on going in this direction and all we know is that there's fog and clouds and dragons, then we have you know, surprises are unpleasant for, for most attorneys. And, and generally speaking, we're risk managers. So you need then to be able to speak in certain yeah, terms. Yeah, you like have to be able to figure out how to how to couch that risk, you know. And if you don't know what the risks are, it makes people nervous. But okay, so let's talk now. Well, I think what what public and private collaboration on OS software development. Yeah, see, that's one place I wanted the talk to go that it didn't necessarily go, and mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not you know I, I'm actually glad that it went the direction that it did. So I'm not I'm not disappointed, but. Um, I know that Sam Adams is going to be here tomorrow, and I know that uh, Eva and David both are very committed of CubeSpace, mm -hmm. are very committed to uh, the notion of developing some really strong links between local government here and the community of software developers that we have who work in open source. And it's it's mutually beneficial for all kinds of reasons. For one thing, open source developers get contracts. Uh, for another, the city doesn't have to pay egregious licensing fees for things that help the city run. Um, so the, it just it, it feels like there's a lot of synergy there. And to the extent that it's a public-private partnership, you can almost posture it as being public public you yeah. know because you're talking about a collective of people who are really interested in working collaborative on software solutions and a public entity that needs software solutions so that's that's just a piece that I think is really important and if there's a takeaway from this conference I'm hoping that he makes that point you know or tries to underline that point tomorrow morning in the keynote but I'm also hoping that that people take it away as a broader value especially for Portland um, I think there's it's, we're just rife with opportunity and even in the courts, too, there's there's places where that's applicable. If you aren't able to attend tomorrow morning, you should know that we'll be streaming. This is right. for other people. Live we'll be streaming, streaming. Um, his keynote tomorrow yeah. morning at 9 o'clock. On the front page. It's on the front page. Of right on osbridge.org. Is it right? on the front page? I think so, isn't it? Somebody should know. Nate, is it on? Yeah. Sure. 
<laughs> Nate says yes. Nate's Nate's uh, got to be right. Nate's super focused right now. So. Yeah, he's uh, he's Nate is now playing the part of Doctor Normal. He's <laughs> Doctor Doc, Uncle. Doctor Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Doctor Uncle. That could be a. That's like a. You know, there should be a secret lair associated with Doctor Uncle. There is. It's in my basement. Oh, right. okay. Got it's it. actually behind. Oh, you haven't been in the no, studio. No, I still haven't been in the studio. Okay, yeah. No, there's a secret room behind the studio, and that would be the Dr. Uncle room. Nice. I need to do something uber cool so that I can be in the studio. On your very own episode of Strange Love Live? Yes. Yes, you do. It's my... It's You've my, done very many cool things. Well, yeah, but I need to do something like, you know... I mean, it has to be groundbreaking <laughs> at this point. It has to be amazing to get yeah. on my show. Yeah, that's pretty much where we're at. Okay, why don't you tell us about the extreme arts and science, extreme arts and sciences stuff? The extreme arts and sciences stuff. I mean, I just, did just want to pitch the fact that that I do, uh, that we work for a consulting firm, my wife and I both, uh, that's based in Eugene but has people in Seattle doing very unopen source things with Microsoft, mm -hmm. as well as you know people here, people down there, uh, working with a lot of uh, nonprofit institutions specifically around managing change and managing humans so that they can manage change better um, and so that they can innovate. And what I find interesting about open source is that the, the, the push to innovate and the push to just solve the problem is, is front and center practically all the time. And so, you know, whatever, it's the arbitrary shtick for, the, for extreme arts on the one hand, but on the other hand, it, you can get very anthropological very quickly about um, some of the organizational models that that emerge out of open source that really could be applied in, in broader corporate context, but that maybe aren't because people, again, there's an unclenching that has to happen yeah, and there's a you know, the less book. control over the project teams and less control over over the entire process or, you know, in some cases, even just letting the lunatics run the asylum. <laughs> um, and I think all of those things have value and there's got to be a way to plug that kind of piece, not just from a development perspective, but from a yeah. from a broader, you know, like team management perspective. So and where can we find them on the on the web? You can find Extreme Arts at easci.com, and it's run on Django, so mm -hmm. there's some open source love at least. Um, and uh, and yeah, it's a you know, it's a work in progress. Since I'm the one who's responsible for it, I'm now <laughs> you know officially have to disclaim how ridiculous it looks in Internet Explorer eight. But uh, but we're working on that. Do people still use Explorer? <laughs> These this this group does not. A lot of our clients, however, yeah. do. For I haven't seen Explorer in yeah in ages. Yeah. That's not a bad thing. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, now the the third super secret thing that the Kelly super secret thing that see, Kelly would not yeah. Uh, the Harry Potter trading card game. Yes. So. Uh, I didn't even read the card. I'm just. Oh, like she didn't even know all. about it. It's just principle. I don't like. Harry Potter trading card game. Yes. It's a good thing that Dr. Normal's not in the room right now. Okay. So when I first moved to Eugene, after being down in San Francisco, Wizards of the Coast had just cut a deal with Warner Brothers as a part of the first movie mm -hmm. to create a trading card game. And unfortunately, Warner Brothers wanted control of all of the aspects of everything. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a good example. Yeah, movie. I know. Isn't that wonderful? So like, the there Harry it is. Potter. They're so excited about Wizards of the Coast. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's... A, I've been trying, uh, so I wrote a ton of articles on it in the in the industry mags, um, you know, from deck strategy to reviews of sets coming out to talking about what the most valuable cards were. Are you a card game nerd? I am a card okay. game nerd to some extent. Yeah, okay. I'm a game nerd generally, but okay. specifically a card game nerd. And so, and and I, I am told the, a charming D and D story earlier. You oh, left. oh, see, I'll tell you later. It's All okay. right. Okay, continue. Did it involve miniatures? No. Okay. No, I didn't ever play with miniatures. All right. Anyway, so um, so for whatever reason, because of all of that, I ended up writing the blurbs that went into the first giganto manual of collectible card games and where to find them and what to do with them and how much value, if any, they still held and all of those kinds of things. And then that's been through several editions and I'm still, the, because the game's dead, they didn't, you know. They didn't even know they made one. Right, exactly. It went through three movies. It got to Chamber of Secrets and then they, um, oh, I guess Chamber of Secrets is the second, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it might have only made it to the end of Chamber of Secrets and just before they were starting uh, the third film, but 
anyway, it's great. And it's a great way to introduce kids to it who are maybe not old enough to read the books because my challenge is, I'm sure your challenge is as well. Our daughters is, are roughly the same yeah, age. Yeah, we're almost exactly yeah. the same age. And, the, and, and they don't get to read the books until no. they're Harry's age. I mean, that's yeah. really, I think, my bellwether is if, if, if you're 11, you get to read book one. Have you let her see the movies? She's seen the first one because it's so saccharine it's absurd it's innocuous yeah and she's seen i think most of chamber of secrets but that's all she that's pretty much all she gets to see Kay has seen one and two and she is yeah. rallying for more and there's there's no way no, from because from prisoner on i mean no i did let her see prisoner oh did you i did and it was after she um she showed a complete um ability to watch jedi oh of course she had a guide yeah <laughs> I thought we watched Jedi, but I could be wrong. See, I think <laughs> I'm about to get in trouble. <laughs> kids and content are so interesting, though, because there's like there are things that would have scared the bejesus out of me as yeah. a child. That Claire's just like, whatever, it's special effects. I mean, I don't know where they know it's not real. Yeah, they they <laughs> actually understand it's not real, and, and and I mean, but so did I, right? But, but I still would have scared you, the crap out of me. Your belief was your disbelief was suspended, right? Suspension of disbelief. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, good. But are they just arbitrarily disbelievers now? I mean, is it is it hard? I think it's just harder to impress them. <laughs> Maybe it is. That I might think be it. They're yeah. just more savvy than we were. Yeah. So I can't remember what we just watched. I think where that I thought my child is more savvy than I am sometimes at this. <laughs> I think I told you this story before, but we were having it. We were driving with her in the back, and she was probably four. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, you can cast your mind back too. Um, and uh, and we were driving along. We were having some sort of idiotic spat about directions, or one of these things that you do when you're married. And and out out of the voice, all of a sudden, there's this kind of tense silence in the car. And she says, "You know, it doesn't really affect me because I understand that you guys love each other." But if there was another kid in the car, they would think that you were trying to be like intentionally hurtful with your words right now. And I was like, okay, baby Buddha, fine. <laughs> um, you know, oh dear. So that was when I knew I was outmatched. You know, actually, I knew long before then. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Just right around. Yeah. So anyway, Harry Potter trading card game. I still have a ton of cards. Mm -hmm. uh, it's and and it's a super fun way to introduce Claire to the world because they did a really good job of kind of capturing the spirit and the flavor of the books, without and so it gives her a Harry Potter fix without um, without requiring the visualization piece. This is not open source, but has she read Jeremy Thatcher, ha Dragon Hatcher? No. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Normal is hanging his head right now. Um, uh, Bruce Coville, Jeremy Thatcher, Dragon Hatcher. Okay. She'll the love it. Key. It's fantastic. All right. And, and age appropriate. She's on She's on something now called Fairy Realm, which I was a little sort of... Uh, eh. I think Kay has the Fairy Realm as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. it's the first in a series. And I saw it at the library and I thought, well, she's because she's doing a summer reading program and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And so, you know, summer you got Summer reading program, they'll get you to read anything. Yeah, exactly. Uh, maybe I could get her some open source manuals. Yeah, <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> I was just trying to work back in. Right, I right, did a right. poor job. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, JP, is there anything else that you want to tell us before you go? And why don't you reiterate where we can find you on the web? Uh, okay, so it's at yes. Yeah, so you're gonna have to edit the crap out of this. Is no, <laughs> I'm gonna leave it the way it is. It's just that he's back so in the room sorry. now. And yeah, yeah. Now. Um, I don't know what I'm saying. So yeah, at Law Duck on Twitter, L A W D U C K. Just mm -hmm. I graduated from law school from the University of Oregon, so it's easy to remember that. I know, it's like, it's so tricky. It makes sense. Um, and valake.com and easci.com if you want to see the kind of other half of, of what I do during the day. JP, thank you so much. Thank you. Please don't delightful. forget to sign uh, the Strength of Life guest board. Oh, I didn't know there was a guest board. Oh, this yeah. is exciting. It's All right. very exciting. Is it, and is it open source? Um, let's see, anyone could make it. Yeah. I'd be happy to share my formula with anyone that asks. See, there you go. I think oh. that counts. <laughs> Does that work? Yeah, sure. All right. It's open source then. <laughs> Thank you, JP. Thank you.